Yes, judges. Hello, Dan. How you doing? You all right? you, bro? I'm actually watching the football, mate. This Surf Shark VPN is a lifesaver, mate. You can watch the football with a dodgy Wi-Fi, even at the Emirates when you've got a big crowd there and everything like that, watching the football. Unbelievable. Easy to set up? Well, it must be if you've done it, mate. Oh, very, very funny. Even abroad you can, like. You can watch all your favourite programmes. It's like being at home, mate. And that's exactly what you guys can do, too. Click the link in the description for Surf Shark VPN. Yes, people, we are back. Welcome back to the channel. What a day. It's been a football. Incredible results. We're going to talk about it. It is myself, your host, as always, Dan Potts. And I'm with my good friend, Kenny Ken. How are you, sir? What a day of football, Ken. You know what? It just shows you what we were missing when we had the international break. And, of course, the FA Cup games as well. You know, I, I've seen... Um, we all started at 12.30... I saw an incredible game of football, incredible. And then you had the three o'clock, some incredible matches, you know, matches that are going to have a say in um, who's going to um, get the top four and also who's going to, you know, probably leave the um, premiership. So that was great as it is. And then we just uh, delayed the show a bit because uh, we watched events in West London where... We thought we were going to see a robbery, larceny, grand larceny, and then all, all of a sudden justice was done within a minute. So we just had it all. Welcome back to the Premiership. Just shows you, as much as I love international football, this is where it's at. The Premiership 100%. really is the most Absolutely. exciting. Not the best, but it's definitely the most exciting um, league in the world without fail. Facts. Well, listen, we're going to talk about it all today because it has been absolutely ram-packed. Before we do that, please make sure you do me a favour, people. There's lots of you in here nice and early. Big up to Ravani, big up to Terry McDee, big up to Craig. Make sure you do me all a favour and smash a like on this one. Make sure you go follow Kenny Ken as well on all socials. And uh, do me a favour, make sure you click on the pinned comment and get yourself Surf Shark VPN. All you've got to do is click it. It's in the description. If not, then just literally click it. Uh, it is going to be an unbelievable... Um, day of weekend of football. Uh, if there's anything to go by today, Kenny, uh, let's start with a game we've just watched. Man, Man United, the robbery that could have been ended up getting the robbers got robbed. <laughs> um, mate, it was yeah. unbelievable ending. It was uh, definitely unbelievable ending. But you you got to um, sort of give kudos to Brentford. I thought they were excellent. They're absolutely brilliant. You know, they completely dominated the game. They gave May not nothing. Nothing to play with in terms of like attacking options. They were on the front foot. I thought Ivan Tony played really well. Although, you know, that chance in the first half, you've got to put them away, especially in a game of that level, especially when you're um, flirting a bit with relegation. You know, I kind of scuffed his shot, hit the post. And then, you know, you would have thought that May United would be a bit better in the second half. But it was just, you know... Um, the same same old in the second half. I thought Brentford just completely dominated the, the midfield. I thought when Burmo came came off came on for Wizza, I thought you know they were dominate dominating. And then you know the busy the goalkeepers was actually uh, well two two um, aspects were busy. The, the crossbar was busy because you know um, Brent, Brentford hit the bar. You know shot. I think it was a um, yeah it was um, Burmo again, isn't it? When um, Hoyland um, fouls him fouls. Um, Tony and Bemo um, steals in and hits the bar, and then it was also a brilliant save for Anana. So I don't think any main United fan would have um, complained at all because if you look at the amount of um, chances Brentford created, apparently when I looked at the stats, it was about 19 chances because I was just watching the game. And then when I looked after, at the stats afterwards, it was embarrassing. It was a complete wipeout. Bruno Fernandes was a was, um, bit ponderous in his possession. You know, I didn't see much of Rashford. Rashford was his usual frustrating self. When he gets into great positions, you think, you know what? This is a guy that's been um, part of the Man United first team for um, eight years now. And he hasn't, um, in terms of improved since he's been an 18-year-old, he's still the same player. Yet, he's getting paid a lot of money, but he isn't delivering the goods, especially in a game like this, where you're vying for the top four. You need more from Rashford. You really need more from him. In fact, Probably their best player was probably their goalkeeper and probably defenders. I thought Wan Bissaka playing on the left was brilliant. But saying that, this is the main United that we've seen since um, Sir Alex has um, dep departed into retirement, and that's the main United you're going to see until you know until they get a complete you know overall 
of playing style and uh, manager. Listen, I, I, I've got to say the same. I don't really understand how Ten Hag's still there, but there's mm. so much going on at United that I don't think he will be there at the end. But maybe they will give him a chance. Who cares? All I care about is that at the moment it's going wrong for Man United and they don't look very good at all. And both clubs, to be fair, had something to play for. Man United are chasing. Brentford are trying to get away from that relegation zone. And I don't think Brentford will go down. I think they've got too many good players. Vissar, Tony, Buemu. I think for me, when they do get some of their injuries back, I think they'll be absolutely fine. But I wanted to move on to the other two games I wanted to talk about next, Kenny, which was obviously Aston Villa Wolves, which is a derby, and Tottenham getting a lucky bloody win against Luton. Mm. Now, I say lucky. I didn't actually see the game. I just heard they probably did deserve mm. to win from what I could hear. But... Um, how close is that going to be now, man? Villa and Spurs, bro, for this Champions League. Do you think both of them are like, sort of, they definitely got it. It's just who comes fourth and who comes fifth now. Well, the thing about them is that they're both very inconsistent, you know, especially since the you know, turn of the year. You know, Spurs haven't, you know, since, you know, we first saw Ange Ball, you know, they've had a few injuries here and they've had injuries with Van der Ven. They've had injuries with... Um, you know, Madison, and they're not playing a kind of free-throwing, exciting football that they, they were playing um, before, before they had those injuries. In terms of, um, you know, the game today, again, Luton, Luton always start off really well. They take teams by surprise. They always they tend to score the first goal and, and then they're, they're kind of holding on. I would say, though, from the little bit I saw, especially when I was watching it, and then, you know, you know, on my phone, Spurs did respond really well to Luton's um, going to go up in the third minute. And, you know, it was pressure for, you know, Luton to um, concede a known goal in the 51st first minute. And after that, it was all Spurs. Where, where Spurs do have a few, um, you know, bits and pieces, I, I noticed that the Spurs fans are getting on the back of um, Brennan Johnson a bit. Because, you know, they expect him a lot because he's got a lot of pace. And also, you know, there's a bit of inconsistency there with um, Kuliszewski. Like, he's been, you know, he looks a bit predictable. But thank God for, um, you know, Son. Son, for me, is one of their best players. He, he's going to go down as a Spurs great. Unfortunately, he's not going to... He hasn't got uh, medals, winning medals to to show for it. But without Son, I don't think Spurs would, you know, have a say in this top four race. In terms of Aston Villa, Aston Villa is another um, team where they have been, um, like, riddled with a bit of inconsistency. You know, Spurs piped them um, three weeks ago. But, you know, beating Wolves, who I thought in the first half, I thought Wolves were a better team. I really thought they were a better team until, you know, Derby scored that goal. And then after, afterwards, I thought, you know, it was mostly um, mostly Villa. And, it took, and then they, they went and ran, ran away with it. In terms of, like, that top four race, Villa have got some um, tri tricky games. Obviously, Villa have got Liverpool, you know, uh, um, at their ground. They've got us away. And then also got Man City at the Etihad. So that probably could um, let Man United through the back door. The same with Tottenham. Tottenham have got us, you know, their um, second to last, um, I think, yeah, their second to last home game. And um, also um, they've got to go to, um, they've got to play Man City in a rearranged game. And also they've got to go to Anfield as well. So in terms of that, that's where you can leave the door open a bit for Man United because obviously Man United, are, you know, they, they're going to need a lot of snookers. However, However, you know, Man United have got home games, albeit against extremely difficult um, opposition. Obviously, us, they're like, you know, their last home game. And obviously, they've got Liverpool um, next week. So, if Man United are going to have any any serious ambitions of um, getting into the top four, or even, you know, um, getting close to the top four, they have to win both those games. So, in a way, it's going to be games... Um, against um, for Spurs games against um, Man City, Liverpool, and Arsenal. The same with Villa as well, where they're playing the same opposition. And obviously, Man United in those games. Obviously, Liverpool next week, but obviously they got us. They got um, um, Arsenal their last home game. So those are the sort of games. But another thing as well with Man United, they need to get more goals from um, certain areas. I believe Man United have only scored a, well. They scored less than they've only scored about forty three goals. Yeah, they have. Or no, we're wrong. Now, a team that's trying to fight for the top four, that's embarrassing. This is Man United. Yep. Man United are known for attacking football, but they concede a lot of chances. They've relied heavily on their goalkeeper. who's made a significant improvement from um, how he started, where he is looking like a proper number one, and they're getting a few players back here and there. But the goal returns embarrassing. I think that's going to cost Man United big time in terms of going for that top four. But in terms of Spurs... 
and um, Aston Villa. They are going to keep it in interesting because I think they're really inconsistent. But whether Man United can take advantage is a big, big ask. Yeah, massive, man. And I mean, Manchester United, for me, they just got to try and pray that they can cling on to some form of European football. Champions League would be an unbelievable achievement for Ten Hag, in my opinion, because I just don't think the team is good enough at all. I really don't. Um, I think Spurs and Villa will definitely get Champions League. And I actually think Tottenham will finish above Villa now um, when they win their game in hand, which I think they probably have a good chance of doing. Um, well, is it their game? Their game in? They're going to have another game in hand. Oh, no, is it well, game in hand? Man City. Who's their game in hand? No, is it Man City? No, no. Spurs, I think I, th I actually think it's actually Villa have got a game in hand. I think Villa might be. I don't know. We'll check oh, anyway. No, no, I, think, well, I thought it was Tottenham. No, I think it's Spurs. Spurs it might be Spurs, City, yeah. man. No, actually, it's Spurs. 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 No, it's actually Spurs. Yeah, Spurs have got the game in hand against Chelsea. So again. That's another game that I, I, I forgot to mention where Spurs have got a wretched record at Stamford Bridge. They've only won once in since 1990. They, you know, six years ago they won 3 1. Apart from that, it's either been a draw or Chelsea won comfortably. Again, Chelsea are not going to want to do Spurs any favours. No, and then 100%. obviously you've got the game against Man City. This is the Man City that I believe is going to be challenging up until the last kick for the, um, the title. So again, that's going to be a very difficult game. But it's going to have a bit of spice, you know, really, really hot spice because Spurs are going for that top four. Who do so, you think will get fourth and fifth? Who do you think will get fourth and who do you think will get fifth then? I think um, I, I, I generally, I generally will put my money on them, um, but I'm only going to put um, a five. I would put um, fifty fifty pound, put a five on probably um, Spurs just to nick it. I think they'll nick yeah. it because I think. You know they they have a good record against Man City at their ground. They probably they're definitely going to lose against Liverpool. You know that's going to happen, and you you would think that um, against us, you know they're going to raise their game to a Titanic level. So mm. I'll probably go for them. in terms of Aston Villa. I think Liverpool have, have got that kind of um, you know forward line to might cause them problems at Villa Park. I don't give them any chance of have, of getting anything against them Man City. I really don't. And then um, us at the Emirates, you don't know what Villa's going to turn up. If we play imperiously, we win comfortably. So, again, these are the key fixtures. I think Spurs have probably got more, are more likely to get more points against these difficult opposition than I think Villa will. But, yeah, again, Chelsea away is Spurs' um, trip tonight. Yeah, it's going to be real tough for me to pick one. But if I had to... I would just go with Spurs, unfortunately. But who cares, man? They're both in the Champions League. It doesn't really matter who comes fourth, fifth. I think we'll get to five places. Um, let's move, Kenny. This game is one that I think will probably go down as one of the games of the season. The 12.30 kickoff, mate. West Ham mm. and Newcastle. Um, I only, Unfortunately, I only saw about 60 minutes of it. So I missed most of the drama at the end because I had to go out. Oh, yeah. And my God, I went out at the worst time, mate. It was mad. I've seen oh, obviously everything back. Oh. But mate, that they, game had everything, brother. Well, well, the, the thing about it is that you you can't you've got to talk about the fact that uh, West Ham went three one up deservedly, I thought, because they were sharper. Newcastle made some different mistakes. The finishing from West Ham was actually brilliant. You know, you know, Newcastle trying to play the offside track when Lascelles went off. Antonio put his chance well, really well, and then you had the situation with New the. Was it share was going on going down when he, he had a collision with um, Kudos? He actually fell Kudos, but he went down holding his face. West Ham take a quick free kick. Kudos smashed it into the net, and then Jared Bowen scored a really good goal with his, his right foot. But you would have thought West Ham were going to win get win that comfortably because Newcastle had a lot of injuries in that game. You had Lascelles, you had uh, Amaron actually came on the substitute and had to go off. So they had everything against them where. where where the key the key um, component of the game was um, a very controversial situation, controversial penalty. Because you look at the whole, looking at the move from from itself, Newcastle pressing West Ham, West Ham are trying to clear the ball. Calvin Phillips does not see Andy Gordon from behind him. In fact, Andy Gordon actually fouls him first. So Calvin Phillips is actually trying to clear the ball, but he actually kicks um, Andy Gordon, who makes up some ground and gets in front of him. By the letter of the Lord, that is a penalty. But the referee should have looked at the whole looked at the whole um, phase of play, and he would have, you know, probably been Charlotte said, "Look, yeah, that was a foul, but hang on, 
there was a foul in the build-up on um, on Phil Phillips. Unfortunately for West Ham, you know, um, Isaac gets his second penalty, and that was it. That was the game changer. That changed everything. Newcastle on the front foot, and then they quickly got their equaliser. And after that, there's only one team going to win it. You know, you've got to give kudos to Newcastle for having to deal with the adversity of the injuries. Also, you've got to give kudos to um, Harvey Bonds, Barnes coming on, scoring two splendid goals, and give kudos to um, Isaac. But in terms of West Ham, in terms of Phillips, I just feel for the guy because, you know, he's had his big move to Leeds, um, to Man City, and this hasn't gone right for him. You know, Peps just clearly doesn't fancy the player. The player has clearly um, um, hasn't got any motivation to get into that side, even if he even if he um, gets himself into a good um, physical shape, there's no way that he's going to play Sam Rodri. So his career's kind of stalled. And then with the Euros coming up, he's also um, down a pecking order for the midfield berth. You know, we're all talking about Kobe Maynard, where, you know, if the move went well for uh, Phillips at Man City, we'd be talking about Phillips and Rice. So that's another um, thing that's gone against Phillips. And then, you know, I saw some videos where he's coming out of the ground, you know, West Ham fans are giving him a stick and he gives him the yeah. finger. I don't know what yeah. West Ham fans expect. I don't know what you expect. You give it the big one, you slag the guy off, he gives you the finger. I don't know why you're outraged by it. If you're going to, you know... Ch- I told him he was it. useless. I said, you're useless, go back. Go. We don't want you at your club. We don't want you at our club. You're useless. And he stuck the finger up. And now West Ham fans are getting the ump. Like, they're basically abusing the guy. He's not their player. He's going to stick his finger up and go, all right, then see you later. I'll go back. It's been a bad it's signing. Good. That's it. Yeah. But you know the thing about it is that a lot of um, football fans are very precious. We love giving it. I mean, you look at some of the football fans who, who, who chuck, chuck it the large. Some of them have oh, yeah. got five bellies. Not not to not not to mention chins that the size of a telephone directory, yet they 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 start giving it the large. And when someone gives it back to them, oh, they're outraged. You know, I thought you guys might be tough lads. You know, from the ends, if you can Agreed. chuck it at someone, expect it back. But in terms of like David Moyes, he's going to get the neck again because of the fact that you know West Ham game management was appalling, absolutely appalling. Regards of. Um, you know, our, what, you know, the fact that, you know, you've got a very um, controversial penalty given against you, you're still, you're still free to up. You've got to be able to manage that. I thought David Moyes deserves um, probably a, a horse whipping because I don't know what sort of shape that Antonio is in, but having Antonio on the field gives them a counter attacking option. It gives him the pace in order to stretch Newcastle, especially when, you know, West Ham are trying to clear the lines. But when you take off Antonio, and you take off your pace, then I'm sorry, the ball's going to keep on going back because not only can Antonio hold the ball up well, he's the sort of player that if you play it through those channels, boom, he's away, and that keeps Newcastle defending. So they can get past Newcastle's high line. But if, you have, if you've got no pace, then Newcastle can easily play the high line and get back into the game. That was where I think David Moyes did let himself down. And I think that's where people like Dan do have a point about Moyes. It was a very, very negative substitution, especially when there was still, still the game was crazy. still pretty tight. Um, it even though West Ham threw one up. New, Newcastle was still, you know, like I said, they were still making in rows, they are still on the attack, taking off Ivan, Ivan you know, um, sorry, not Ivan Tony, um, Mikko Antonio, in order to try and, um, you know, save him, save his energy or try and, you know, play at the match with that amount of time to go was criminal. Criminal. Was, no wonder. Listen, Calvin Phillips hasn't been a good signing for West Ham. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Right? But the tactics from Moyes was absolutely shambolic there for me. Definitely, definitely. Absolute killed the game for me. And West Ham at 3-1 up. Fair play. I thought Paqueta and Kudos in the first half were class. Antonio was really good. Bowen, always yeah. a threat. Second half, like fair play to Newcastle. Obviously, they turned it on. Newcastle got lots of injuries. They got three more players injured again, and still won in, the game. In that, in, that, in that match, they got injuries, and you know, you know the thing that you know um, that was um, ironic as well. The fact that and Anthony Gordon pulled up um, with a hammy. He got kicked, and <laughs> believe it or not, the funny thing was is that the man in the match got sent off. That's why I think we even forgot about. It. You know, he got sent off after because he kicked the ball away when Newcastle went. F- um, four three up. So, you know, he wasn't able to receive his man of the match um, award from um, you know the BT, say TNT commentators. But again, that's the kind of game that 
you know that makes the premiership however in terms of quality that is one of the that's one of the games that makes you think you know what the premiership ain't all that because the defending was horrendous from both sides absolutely horrendous yeah, yeah man 100 percent. and it was a game where all everybody kept saying commentary wise was we expected a lot of goals i was listening to it on talk sport we expect a lot of goals here wow they got them man four three mm. lastly on this game what does that mean for both clubs newcastle and west ham like west ham have got literally three or four of them chasing the pack for that um conference league place and european places mm. and newcastle like, I don't think they've had a very good season at all, but hmm. they have had a lot of injuries. And if they get them back, they might have a chance to push. But where do you see both these teams finishing, Kenny? West Ham and well, you, Newcastle? You look, you look at Newcastle's kind of running. They don't have to play in the big teams, um, Newcastle. Newcastle, And I think that's probably where, you know, they're going to be in good stead. But the fact is, is that if Isaac is injured, that's it. There's, hmm. they've, got, they've got no one, no one in the attack because they've lost, um, you know, Callum Wilson. For the rest of the season, so you take a, you know, like you take a Isaac. Where's the goals going to come from? Obviously, you could try and put Anthony Gorda in there, and you could probably play Amor on. But I think injuries are probably going to hurt Newcastle, despite the fact that they don't have to, you know, play the big teams. I think the only team in the top six they got to play is it's Tottenham. They, do they have to play Spurs at the St uh, James's? Yeah, I think they do. Yeah, so you know, they've got to play Spurs at St James's, and then when you so. That if they can get past Spurs and James's and put a run together, who knows? They could get that conference um, place. West Ham on the other end, they've got a few different games. They've got Spurs this Tuesday, massive, massive derby. Remember, Spurs have you know just beaten Luton. West Ham was we smarting from the fact that they they lost to Newcastle. For them, they probably think um, controversial, probably down to Phillips and Moyes. Most important thing for West Ham as well. They have beaten Spurs this season already. They've beaten them at the Tottenham Hospital Stadium, so they could take that kind of encouragement. But I mentioned the fact they've got to play Tottenham on Tuesday. They also got to play Man City, and then they got Liverpool as well. Man City and Liverpool are both going for that title. And they're going to be relentless. They're going to be ruthless. You know, if West Ham can win both those games, then once... Once again, you'll make them favourites for the Conference League at least. But who knows? If Man United keep on playing like they are, they could get dragged into the Conference League. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? it is yeah, mad. because you know instead of being playing for UEFA, because Man United have got three things to kind of go for. They don't really want the UEFA, you know, the Europa League, but they're in pole position for that. And then if they keep on you know, pl- becoming them Jekyll and Hyde, they could get dragged into the Conference League um, um, fight as well. Listen, I, I think Newcastle, with their first 11, are a good side. Their squad's not good enough and it's been proven. I think sometimes people give Eddie a little bit of stick. I think he deserves some of it this season. I don't think tactically he's been as good as perhaps people mm. have given him credit for previously. But with that many injuries, I suppose it's going to be difficult. As for West Ham, I actually think this is probably one of the best West Ham sides I've seen in the Premier League era. Mm. I really do. I think they've got a strength in most positions in their first 11. They're probably three or four players short in their first 11. But other than that, they've got good players. I just think David Moyes is so boring to watch. And I understand it might get him European trophy because they're hard to beat in Europe, teams like that. But other than that, West Ham, like if they want to actually move forward, I think they might have to part ways with David Moyes. I've put West Ham in the top half this season, but I never had them seventh. I actually put them tenth, to be fair. And they've impressed well, me yeah. in the fact they've got better than that. But they could still finish tenth quite easily. Oh, definitely. I think I think it's easy for us as Arsenal fans to think, oh, what's the problem with David Moyes? We look at the stats. We look at the results they've had in, in the last few years. Remember, he got them into the European competition in the first place during the you know, lockdown season where they finished good. In fact, yeah, where they finished sixth. You know, they, yeah. you know, so they had Jesse Lingard, and then they got to semi-finals of the of Europe, losing to um, the eventual winners Frankfurt, and then l- last season they won the Euro- European Conference League, and he's won them their first trophy since 1980 when they beat us in the FA Cup final. So, on paper, from the outside looking in, of course we're going to say, "Well, you lot mad," but people like Lawless, he knows West Ham better than any of us. Mm. He's he he goes to every West Ham game. He. He's basically got a finger on the pulse, which is West Ham. You know, he, he, so he's more qualified than us to, you know, comment on whether Moyes is the right man or not. One thing I would say, though, is that 
for, for West Ham to play that expansive football, you need to have the players, you need to have the, the, the funding for the players. But also, whoever comes in, if Moyes um, gets let go, they've got to have the balance between playing the attractive football that people like Dan, Dan Lawless demands and also being difficult to beat. You've got to get that kind of balance. And those kind of players tend to go to teams further up the table. They tend to go to a Man United. They tend to go to a maybe a Spurs, but definitely tend to go to, you know, an Arsenal, Man United and Liverpool. And that's the thing. It's about attracting these players as well, as well as uh, attracting a manager. And you've got to remember, as if you're at West Ham, those sort of players that Lawless want, they're going to use West Ham as a stepping stone. So you're going to have to have that con conveyor belt of um, talent. And you've got to look at your juniors as well. To see it up. Because remember, West Ham have had a tradition of having good youngsters coming through. Listen, West Ham, I think, are a good side. I just don't think they've got a squad that's strong enough to get them European football. And I said that at the start. Lawless was like, oh, yes, out of all that we have, we have. Well, go do it then. But I don't think they will. Well, well, you, 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 can't, you can't knock him, though. You can't knock him because you you think you think about it. They're actually in the position to get into the Europa League again. They're in the quarterfinals of the... Um, Absolutely. Of, of the Europe, of the Europe, sorry, Europa League. They got Labour because, and don't get me wrong, Labour because are smashing every team in sight. But West Ham do have that experience of being in the semi final of the Europa League and the experience of winning the tournament. So they're going to be difficult to beat. And you can't, as much as the rest of Europe are going to favour Leverkusen, don't be surprised West Ham getting that semi final. So you, it's still not all bad for West Ham. But, you know, they're going to have to, if we're for West Ham to, you know, get where they want to be in terms of like, the league in Europe, they're going to have to tolerate David Moyes for quite for a, for a bit more, because mm. at the moment, I've seen it where teams are steady eddies, they do really well while they get into the top half of the table on a consistent basis, and then they try to expand, try to play, you know, more expansive football, try you know more attractive football, try and get the players. Not they don't do their research, they just buy the name, and then all the things that they're doing really well in terms of defending and being more compact, they lose that and then they become more susceptible to, um, you know, like attacking teams. I've seen it before, a lot of teams where they try to, you know, expand themselves. I'm not saying it won't happen in West Ham, but, you know, if they do get rid of David Moyes, two things they're going to need. Have the money to get the players that you need to get up that maybe challenge for the top four and get a manager, preferably someone who's hungry, but... Always accept that the players they're going to get are going to use it as stepping stone. How long are they going to hold on to kudos? How long are they yeah. going to carve on the guitar? How long well, are they going to hold on to the go in the Yeah. So you think about it, they're better players. Those three players I mentioned, they may not hold, hold on to them for long. I agree. I totally agree, man. Um, I think Pakatar is going to go to Man City, and I think he would have if it weren't for that gambling rumour. Now that's been cleared, I think he'll go there. Kudos, I wanted him at Arsenal. That was the one I wanted to replace uh, and cover for uh, for Saka. But we'll see what happens. Uh, listen, before we come to Arsenal City, man, I've got to talk about Chelsea. Proper Chelsea, mate. They are in the mud. Let me tell you this now. Chelsea Football Club are finished, mate. They're dusted under this ownership, and I'm here for it. And let me tell you this. Chelsea football uh, fans that are out there on Twitter, they're accepting this or a disgrace, in my opinion. Because if this was Arsenal, I'll be asking all my Arsenal fans to storm the pitch at the end of mm. their games because this is a joke now. Like, let me let, let me first of all say that the referee decision is one of the worst you'll see in a long time. Don't know if you've seen it, but the sending off and the penalty is an absolute joke. But Chelsea are a joke, mate. Their ownership is poor. Their manager is trying to do the best he can with a bad bunch. And at the times, he's got it horrendously wrong. He's underperforming. The team itself are basically relying on Cole Palmer, who's a Man City mm. player that, to be fair, Pep probably should have kept hold of. But other than him, they've got terrible players, mate. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not going to get behind the fact that these Chelsea players are great. Caicedo's underachieving, underperforming. So is Enzo. Mm. They're two good players, but they ain't good in this system, right? Mm. Some of that's on the manager. Some of that's on them because actually they can just say, do you know what? This manager's crap. I'm going to do my own thing. Cole Palmer, fair play to you. Malo Gosto, fair play to you. The rest of them, I think they look awful, mate. And today, against Burnley's mm. 10 men, they couldn't beat him, Kenny. This is a dusted finished club, mate. They can't even get in the top half again. Well, the, the thing about it is that what killed Chelsea was basically the British government. You know, the Ukraine-Russia um, war um, killed Chelsea Football Club. The minute, you know, it was that that was when it was dusted. But there were you would have thought that the seas were there already. Because let's not forget, 
Abramovich was was um, in the process of rebuilding Stamford Bridge. Then he had, a, but a few years before that, he had an issue with his um, citizenship for the British government. So he pulled out of that because he already had the ump. Then you know, forcing it to sell Chelsea, where you got new owners, of basically fixing something that wasn't broken. Mm. You know, he left. He what Abramovich left. He left a mentality where winning is all that counts. You know, he, he, he had people like Petr Cech, you had Grand Skyer, all of them left with uh, Abramovich. It was like they're trying to remove everything that, you know, that Abramovich left. They even removed everything, you know, that reminded the club of, of Abramovich. And they've now gone to this um, system of trying to get buy up the best young players, sell them on, and, and use that as their transfer policy, which Chelsea used to do anyway. Remember, let's not forget, under Abramovich, Chelsea had a lot of players on loan. And when the, when these players um, were at these clubs for two or three years, they sold them at a massive, massive profit. And that was their transfer policy. And I think they're trying to do the same thing here. The problem with Chelsea have got is that they're buying up this, this great young talent, um, talent, but where's the leaders? Where's the experienced players? By all means, buy all those players, but these um, youngsters need experience around them. And I mean decent experience. You need experience in midfield and experience in defence and also maybe some a bit more experience. Raheem Sterling should be doing a lot more. He should be leading yeah. that team as far as I'm concerned because the experience of Raheem Sterling is a mess since he, um, he's he been at Liverpool, he's been at Man City, he's now at Chelsea. He should be the leader of that team. It doesn't matter whether, whether he's got he's got leadership qualities or not. He should, bloody, he should, he should find them because that team is devoid of any leadership. You buy Modric for a lot of money, yet you don't know what to do with him. He's got no one, he's got no, he's got no one on the field to sort of like tell him, hey, hang on it, get there, do this and do that. Like we have at Arsenal, like Liverpool have it with their players and obviously May May C. It's a little wonder that you can have the best, you can pay as much as you can pay a billion pounds for that squad. But if you're just buying players who are up and coming. And there's no kind of structure, no leadership. Then it's no, it's no wonder they are going to be very inconsistent. You know, they get what they deserve. Top bowling in itself deserves a lot of criticism because of how, how he handles it. But it's the whole, the whole um, the consortium around them. They've basically fixed something that isn't broken. In terms of Chelsea fans protesting, so they should. But you know, we had the same thing at Arsenal. Some people who you know believed that you know. Um, Success is periodical. They think, oh, you've been spoiled by every by success. You can't win all the time. Some teams have their cycles. That's what it, it is. Where it is, and you've got a situation in other countries. Real Madrid, as far as they're concerned, they should be dominating from forever. Hence the fact that they do have a conveyor belt of managers. The crowd are very demanding. The same with Bayern Munich. Though we're going to get the Bayern Munich in a minute, but mm. Chelsea. Fans are a bit divided. The younger ones have only known success under Abramovich. The have. other ones are more philosophical because they they watch Chelsea when they're in the sort of like equivalent of the championship. So they think, oh yeah, we're happy. We're going to die happy. So you know, in terms of getting fans to sort of storm the pitch, I don't know, mate. I think if you don't mind me saying, a lot of um, fans nowadays they're conflicted with um, what you know how they support a football club. You've yeah. got to remember, Chelsea, is, Chelsea are not the Chelsea of um, the 80s. Chelsea, like Arsenal, have got a lot of um, celebrity fans. They've got a lot of um, fans who, um, who, who are prevalent in new media. In the media. They've got, yeah. they've got overseas fans as well. Because you face it, if you're, if you're um, an overseas fan and you're coming to London, there's only two there's Well, there's three clubs now because Spurs are getting that kind of um, fan base from overseas as well. So, they're hardly going to be the kind of fans that are going to lead the news usually on a football field. Yeah, facts, man. Listen, I don't know about you, but if Chelsea are buggered with this FFP, which apparently people say they are, mm. I'd be putting in a bid for Cole Palmer in the summer, hundred percent. And well, I'd say to them, go take the sixty million, and they'll go yes because they're stuffed for money well, and he's English. Yeah, so, well, well, that's well, what I'll be doing. Dan, you you just used one. Well, you used. Uh, a buzz sentence where you said, "If Chelsea are like I said, are like strangled by FFP, go and buy, um, you know, um, Cole Palmer." Well, the fact they sold um, Havertz suggests that they are. 
you know, like strangled by FFP. They will never have sold Kai Havertz if there wasn't there wasn't any sort of um, investigations of um, you know them being in breach of FFP. There's no there's no way Chelsea would have sold sold that player willingly. No way. There's no way they would have sold Mason Man. In terms of like their ages, and the, in terms of the resale value, there is mm. no reason to sell those two players. The reason why they sold them is because they amassed a lot of um, you know, of, of signings, spent a lot of money on players. You know, Fernandez. They 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 knew they're going to get Casado. They knew they're going to get Lavia. So in order to meet their FFP um, consideration, they had to sell Havertz. They had to sell Mount. So. You you saying that there's FFP um, considerations? Well, that's been a, that was a case last season. Look at Newcastle. You know they're going to have to sell Gumarish. They're going to have to sell Isaac because, despite the fact that they've got massive um, potential, massive funding from um, the you know like Saudi Arabia, they can't spend the money because the fact is is that they're, they're not making enough money in order to operate at a level where they can you know, like spend money on them players. They have to be able to show they're making a profit. So they're going to go. That's the reality of our situation. The Premier League are not messing around. If you breach FFP, they're coming for you. 100%. They're coming for you. 100%. And uh, that. Um, let's move, before we do, lastly to ask for City. Uh, Gary asked a good question. Dan and Kenny, how do you feel about Bayern Munich? Um, Bayern Munich Arsenal. Sorry, do you think we have what it takes to beat them, or do you like me still have PTSD over the 10 to aggregate scores from the past? Well, Bayern Munich today, Kenny, you watched it mm. and they had Dortmund. What the hell happened, mate? They lost again, didn't they? Well, I'll tell you one thing about Bayern Munich. One of the things uh, about Bayern Munich is that was shocking is the way Dortmund done them at Ranham, murdered them on the counter attack, especially in that second half. You know, thank God for their goalkeeper. And you you look at Bayern Munich, they play that high line. But if you're playing a high line with Delish and um, Dyer, God help you. God help you. Trust me, if Arsenal had like a strike like Thierry Henry, we would absolutely batter them. Mm-hmm. Batter them. They're there for the taking. They're really there for the taking. You know, Muller looks slow and ponderous today. I thought Sane worked his nuts off, but... You know, he wasn't the same player. I thought, um, you know, Afonso Davis, the player that we were all lauding, he looks he looks a shell of the player he was to that the player wow. he was um, last season. And then you've got the situation where you've got um, Goretzka, slow as anything. And that's not just criticisms, what I saw today. And then you, you've you got one thing that Bayern Munich do have in their favour, Kingsley Coleman's come back from injury. Although, yeah, good looked, player. Um, he looked a bit, you know, off the pace. Harry Kane, you know, is the same old Harry Kane. He works hard, gets into good position, got a goal chalked off. But when you look at this Bayern Munich side, they look really, really off the pace. You know, you would have, you know, I think Kimmich was right when he said that Bayern Munich played um, the second, played the second half, though it was a friendly. They were awful. They were walking. They had no desire. I'm not saying I'm not saying that they didn't have any desire, but when it came to like doing the hard work, you know, the tempo, they just couldn't cope with Dortmund on that counter attack. Seriously, you know, I think um, if Bayern Munich to have any chance against us, I think they're going to ref- have to rethink that centre half pairing of um, you know um, Dyer and um, Dele because. We've got, I don't know what the situation is with Mancano. I know he got sent off in um, some key games um, that cost Bayern in Europe, and obviously, although Bayern is still in the, the quarterfin- quarterfinals, and he'll say cost them the Bundesliga. But he's one player that has. Have we lost you, Kenny? No, I'm back. He's, back. he's, he's, he's one player that, that has the pace. He's one player that, if you want to play a high line, he's your man. Hundred percent. Are you with us, Ken? No, you're not, are you? <laughs> Your Wi-Fi is dodgy, mate. I don't know if you've come back or not. Kenny, are you there? No, we've lost Kenny for the minute. Hello. Oh yeah, you're back, mate. You're back. 
I was never away, mate. But what I was trying oh. to say is that <laughs> one of the things with Bayern Munich, if you want to, if you want to play the high line, if they want to play the high line, they they're going to commit suicide against us, especially if we have Martinelli because you're playing a high line with Goretzka, you're playing a high line um, in front of the back four, you're playing a high line with, you know, De Lich, who's not, who hasn't got any pace, good defender, great on the ball, hasn't got pace, and you're going you're also playing a high line with um, Eric Dyer. We know what Eric Dyer's about. We know Eric Dyer's a hard working footballer, not bad on the ball, but he's got no pace. So that's where that's where we could hurt by him with, with, with our pace. But one one of the things we we got to do against Bayern, we've got to make sure that we're on it, you know, from sort of like defensive point of view, especially in the midfield, because you know Musiala was a bit cumbersome today. Didn't play his best football. Sane was a bit average. Muller looked his age today. We still got to be a bit cautious. But from what what I've seen, all the reports I've received about Bayern Munich not being a side that that, that everyone um you know put makes them out to be in the last few years was correct. They've I've seen they've definitely I've seen got players. That, they've definitely got players that can hurt us, no doubt. Kane, Coleman, Sane, Nabry, Goretzka, Michel. Well, Nab- Nabry didn't get on today. Nab- right. Nabry, Nabry didn't get on the pitch today. He didn't get on. He's he's very much on the bench. You know um What's it? Um, the guy who played for Stoke City, uh, Trooper Moting. Oh, Trooper Moting. Trooper Moting. He actually came on, and so he, you know, he was in, involved in the game. So it's one of those games where if you don't beat Bayern now, you never beat them. But one yeah. thing you got, you do, you do um, have to take in consideration if you know what I believe that they're out of the Bundesliga title race. They're thirteen points behind um, Dortmund with seven games to go. Then I think they're going to put all their eggs in the basket of the Champions League. So if they're putting all their eggs in that Champions League basket, they're going to be significantly dangerous. I, I honestly believe if we go to the Allianz Arena with confidence, we need to be 2 0 up in the first leg or 3 1 up in the first leg. I won't have massive amounts of confidence. I mean, I still think we can beat them, don't get me wrong, because mm. of the way they're playing, Ken. But I think we, if we have 2 0 at the Emirates, which I think we can mm. do. I'll have the confidence we can beat them. But you never know. If you're like 1-0 up or if it's 1-1 at the Emirates, anything can happen in that Champions League. And like well, you say, it's the only chance they got of a trophy, mate. Well, definitely. That's the only chance of a trophy. And obviously, it's Kane's only chance to get a trophy. Let's let's not remember, Kane left Spurs to go to Bayern Munich because he was guaranteed trophies. You know, that in terms, if he wanted to actually earn massive, massive money, he probably would have gone to Man United. But Man United are not a serious club. Bayern are a serious club. But... You know, they're a club that is definitely in transition. You know, certain players that, you know, have been playing their best football um, over the last couple of years. It's not the same, you know. Lewandowski's left, although Kane has made them more than made up for his um, his yeah. absence. One one thing you will say about Bayern Munich, in hindsight, it's 2020, but you can you can definitely say hindsight is, um, is relevant. You look at the goals they conceded against a very bad Man United side. The first game of the Champions League, they won 4-3, yet Man United were able to get some late goals in order to make the scoreline close, even though the performance wasn't that close. But you saw a bit of this kind of defensive priorities early in September. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. Defensively, they haven't been the same. That hence the fact that You've sacrificed the um, sort of the pace of um, of Meccano and the pace of Kim, and you've got you know defenders who can who are actually good defenders, good on the ball, but pace, whew, high line. Again, it doesn't even matter if they're playing against us. Yeah, it's, it's any team with, with with pace and strong runners, they're going to get hurt. I so, repeat, Dortmund mullered them on a the counter attack, mullered them. Watch it, watch it. Watch it, watch it again. That's where we can do them on the character. I'm not talking about the Emirates. I'm talking about at, at the Alliance. Facts. At the Alliance. Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. Listen, you've got to be confident having them for sure. Listen, before we close, we've got to talk about tomorrow, mate. It's an absolutely massive game. My first question to you is the first question I've had for everyone. It's not how you're feeling, what do you reckon the score will be, how are we going to beat Man City? My question is what the hell is our team going to be, Kenny? Because I think the left-hand side, there's some serious question marks about who's going to play. So name me from 1 to 11 who you would uh, who you would play if it was you, mate. Well, for Arsenal? 
Well, yeah. my one to eleven, my one to eleven is obviously going to be Raya in goal, right back Benjamin White, left back. On form, you've got to go with Kivior. Yeah. However, you look at Kivior against um, the opposition we've been playing, especially in that eight-game run. He hasn't been tested a set for once, probably against Liverpool, and he passed that test with flying colours. You'll think that he's going to have a bigger test tomorrow. However, he deserves the right to start because he has, he is banging form, and I think you know we have to we have to believe that he he, he will be the main. You know, so like I said, past that test, obviously he's going to come up against them. Um, well, they're going to interchange. He's going to either Foden's going to start the as part of the front three, but he's going to interchange with Bernardo Silva, where they're going to, you know, flip flit in and out of that, that position down the left. And then also they're going to interchange with Doku. So Kivior's going to have probably two or three players to watch during the football match. But I do think he's a better man. I think Tommy Asu, yeah, man marking 100% you're playing, but in terms of match fitness, you may have to ignore him. So Chenko, if we're playing at home, then... You play Sinchenko because you want to dominate the ball. But if you're going to play Sinchenko where you know you're going to be without the ball for a long, long time and you know you're going to be defending a lot, sorry, it's a no-brainer. Give your starts for me. Centre-halves. Centre-halves. I believe Gabriel Magalish is going to be fit. So if he's fit, he starts with Saliba. Your midfield, I see where you're asking that question. Midfield, Odegaard and Rice. Jeez, you know what? I'm not. My head tells me. My head and heart says Thomas Partey. Because I think that the reason why I want Thomas Partey in that in that in that in that position in that in that position, one it like it allows him and himself and Declan Rice to one to hold, one to go forward. Both of them can take turns to do that. Another do you thing. Think do you think he'll he was playing enough football party? Well, the thing about it is he, he's 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 um he's had the international break off. He hasn't gone with Ghana. You know he's he's had more training sessions. I think it's it's not going to be that much of a risk to start him. Whilst it would be a risk to start Tommy Asu because Tommy Asu hasn't any football. At least Tom's party has come on in games. You know, and um, you know, like I said um, at a few minutes. Tommy Asu, I believe, hasn't any minutes, so it would be a temptation. I can understand playing Jorginho because Jorginho does keep the ball really well. And yeah. if if you have a situation where we're not going to have enough of the ball, you at least want someone who's tied in possession. So that's that's one that we got to come back to. I can see why if you do play Jorginho, it's actually a good attacking move as well, as is with Pai, because you look at it, Man City's midfield. Their midfield is going to have Rodri, and then he's going to have two attacking midfielders. He's going to have Kevin De Bruyne, an attacking player. He's also going to have Bernardo Silva, an attacking player. So mm -hmm. basically, Rodri, from a defensive point of view, has to do two other people's jobs, a bit like Partey, when um, we, we had Jacker and um, Odegaard and so where both of them were tended to um, play in a more attacking role, whilst Partey had to protect the defence on his own. We now know that if we do have a situation now with Detton Rice and probably with um, Thomas Pike, at least we're going to be more solid. And as a team, we're more solid off the ball. But from an attacking point of view, Man City, if we're brave, we'll leave um, attacking spaces for us to run into. Because I'll tell you now, Rodri will have to do a lot of defend, um, protect, protection and defence on his own because De Bruyne... Although he will be willing to do that, and of course Foden and Bernardo Silva do it, that's not their strengths. So if we are going to dominate, we've got to exploit those sort of spaces. Also, in terms of my front three, my preferred front three is going to be up top, Kai Everts, because from an a, um, attacking point of view, you're going to have someone who can hold the ball up. And that's why I'm going to go with Kai Havertz. Saka yep. picks himself. Martinelli's a one where, again, very interesting. You look at, they haven't got Kyle Walker. So it's highly likely they're going to play Rico Lewis. In, in centre defence, you're going to have a Kanji and Diaz. At left back, you're going to have Ake. A Kanji's quick as anything. Rick, Rico Lewis, yeah, he's, he's a handy runner, but he's also better on the ball than Kyle Walker. Again, 
Man City are going to look to dominate the ball. So, again, it's on that counter-attack. We all know that Pep likes to um, defend with a high line. So, the reason why he wants to defend with a high line is so they can press the opposition and the stakes and try and get rid of stakes. Nah, Martinelli with that high line, without Walker, yeah. that's a player that I'll definitely, definitely pick to exploit that high line. Once Martinelli gets in those positions, Havertz can make his run. We can get the runners from midfield. Odegaard can get further forward and also Saka can be interested because there are going to be aspects of the game where Man City are going to be on the front foot. They could be pressing. Who knows? They could be a goal down. Or who knows? It can get to 70 minutes. They probably think, right, we need to win this in order to, um, you know, lay down a marker in this championship. That's where the space is going to be occupied because they we win the ball back. You're only going to have Rodri doing two or three people's jobs. That's where the space is going to be. That's where Arsenal got to attack those spaces that those attacking players are going to leave for Rodri. And then what will happen is that we can get straight at that defence because they're playing that high line. Mate, it's uh, it's mad because Man City fans I speak to believe that Rico Lewis won't start and it will be a Kanji right back. It will be Diaz and Ake and then Gvardio at left back. And he might play Ake or Gvardio at left back. It could be. Guardiola is actually better on the ball. He's actually very, very good on the ball. Mm. But from a centre-half point of view, the, the situation is, is that if you play him at centre-half, he has been, he does get caught in possession and that's where we can exploit it. In terms of uh, Ake, down that left-hand side, Ake we, will give, probably give them a bit more than, um, than um, you know, in terms, in terms of... Um, Attack, attacking wise, then I think that um, Guardia would do. Although Guardia has a better passer, but in terms of like the pace, Ake's got the actual pace. Rico Lewis is an interesting one because obviously he's not as quick as Kyle Walker. But mm. if Man City want to play an inverted right back, he's your man. He mm. can easily slip in that midfield. So if Man City are going to go on the front foot and you know dominate possession from an attacking point of view, you you would probably would play. Rico Lewis, not just the fact that he's going to bomb down the, the flanks, but also he's going to invert as well, giving an extra opportunity in midfield. Also, if there's a situation where they're attacking players, you know, like leave a bit of space when we're on the ball, he can come in there and give Rodri a hand. You know what I mean? So that way, he's not he's not he's not just him, you know, trying to quell um, our, our attacking them. Um, Impetus in the midfield, so that's where in the midfield they, they they've got options. They could play Rodri and Kovacic, or they can play yeah. Rodri, Bernardo, and KDB, and then have yeah. Foden wide, and then obviously up top you got Haaland. So there's options there, man. They have got Doku yeah. and Greedish as well. Like, like people are talking yeah, about. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I do I do think that Doku would play because I think Doku is is, is kind of his main man. I think even before injury, Greedish got injured. Doku is a bit more direct than Greedish. Doku's Gives them a bit more kind of, you know, creativity. Don't get me wrong. On the eye, Greenish is more pleasing in the eye. But in terms of like the actual genuine pace, Doku's the man. Obviously, Empire Doku's got to work on significantly. But you look at Doku and you think, yeah, the pace that will 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 um, favour him. And I do think he'll start in, instead of Greece. And obviously, Greece hasn't played that much football as well. So if Man City are going to be in the front foot. They are going to play Doku. They're definitely going to play Phil Foden, who does find those little spaces where he doesn't just hog the right hand side. He gets into those little little spaces in in in, uh, in between the uh, the front three. He could play. He will get into like the attacking areas, and also he he'll swap with Doku as well. Obviously, the most important thing you've got to worry about as well is that we even we even mentioned them De Bruyne. De Bruyne is going to have a free role where. He sometimes he'll you know he'll, he'll go through the middle. He might come on the left. He might come on the right. Either way, he is looking to get Holland to the ball into the game, either through quick crosses, through balls, or just making runs where he takes defenders that, um, away from him, and then he makes that quick pass for Holland. So that's where Man City are going to be attacking. I do think that Man City's best chance of winning the game is if they play an actual game and they try to um, take the game away from us. So mm. I do think that's where they're going to play anyway. And that's where we're going to do a significant amount of defending. Mm. 
Facts, man. Gabriel and Saliba need to be on their game. Obviously, Haaland, he can do nothing for like 95 minutes and then 96th, he can win. He can win you the game. So you gotta be uh you gotta be keeping it. Listen, let me ask you this, man, before I come to your, your predictions of the game. Um, we're gonna have to have a 10 out of 10 performance from the team, right? But if I was to pick tell you that uh three players at Arsenal are gonna play nine or ten out of ten performances, which three do you think need to turn up for us to win the game? Which three would you well, select? It's, it's gonna have to be it's gonna be after it's gonna have to be um well Saliba's gonna have to have a good game. Mm-hmm. We, in terms of like um the games this season, he had that I have seen um evidence of some sort of sloppiness and overconfidence in it you know, or in his position in the side. There's no doubt he's a fantastic player. There's no, I'll never, ever disagree with that. However, I, there is a bit of sloppiness. So he has to be on it. He has to be on it because he's not just going to have to worry about um, Haaland. Obviously, I, he, Haaland could be a direct opponent, but he's also got, you know, like I said, be on, you know, watch for, you know, Foden's quick feet and also, you know, like the runs made by KDB and also Doku. So he's got to have eyes at the back of his head. Another one who definitely needs a good game, it's got to be Saka. Because Saka's going to be that on the counter-attack. He's going to have to be that outlet. I'm not just talking about Saka, you know, goal threat and Saka delivery, but he needs to work. He needs to work um, a can, uh, sorry, um, Ake or Guardio, Guardiola. But I do think it's going to be Ake, so he needs to work Ake. Another thing he needs to do, he needs to push Ake back. You don't want a mm-hmm. situation where Ake's making those runs down the left-hand side. That because if they're if they're making runs down the left side, he's doing it easy, and then Saka's not doing his job from a defensive point of view. But from an attacking point of view, get Ake defending. That's where he, he can't go missing. Odegaard as well. This is a massive game because you know it's uh that's the one for me. Odegaard's the one who needs to turn yeah. up for me. Well, yeah, you know, because it, again, it's it's that kind of um game where you know there's a debate between uh Marshall fans and Man City fans who's the better player, Odegaard or Lebronia. Well, there you go. Pro- prove it. Show show us what you got because yeah, you know, end of the day, it's the tail of the tape. Whoever you know, one one of those players could be lifting the uh, the Premiership title. It's a game like that where it could where it could decide which player is going to lift the title for their club. Absolutely, and you know, listen, I was asked that question, and I picked Saliba. Uh, I actually picked Saliba and Gabriel because I know they're two different players. They kind of come as a pair for me because that is the one that you have to actually uh, properly be on their game. But I picked um, Declan Rice and Martin Odegaard, the head of Saka, mm-hmm. because I feel like that midfield battle could be won. I feel like Saka and Martinelli could be outlets. Mm-hmm. But for me, Rice and Rodri and Odegaard and De Bruyne, they're going to be looking at those two players big time, man. And uh, and looking at Havertz to link up play, of course. But mm-hmm. for me, I think if Odegaard and Rice turn up in that midfield, and whether it's Jorginho and Party who try to dictate the play, I think if we win that midfield battle, I think we've got a great opportunity of winning. Ken, it, it, I really do. It, it, it is a great opportunity, but it's you know, I think that that mid the midfield, and I think the way Arsenal are going to play it, I think that they're going to have to suffer a bit. They're going to have to suffer the fact that they're going to be without possession. They're going to have to suffer the fact they're going to have to run and get into those positions in order to block those um, offensive, you know, attacking runs from Man City. Also, mentally, whilst they're having to do their jobs defensively, they've also got to be able to exploit the spaces that Man City are going to leave because they are, they they will leave Rodri exposed because of the way they play. They're attacking. They're always on the front foot. Look at this. You only have to look at what happened with Liverpool at Anfield. When Liverpool got into those little spaces that where Rodri was not given the support in the midfield, where Liverpool mm. went through them for a knife of butter. Why did Liverpool go for a knife of butter? Because they were able to get that back four. Had it had um Diaz, you know, um, you know, like had his shooting boots on, Liverpool win that game 3 1. Mm-hmm. And that's 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 where um Arsenal are going to have to exploit it because they're not going to have many opportunities to exploit Man City in that, in that area, especially when it's at the at the At the Emirates, also, you know, you would think that we'd have, we'll be more in the front foot. But tomorrow, that is an area where I think the game can be won for Arsenal. So mm. you've got to get that. You you got you have to accept you're not going to have the ball that much. You're going to have to accept for seventy percent of the time you're going to be on on the back foot. But that little thirty percent, especially when it's nil nil. In the seventy-fifth minute, you have to be brave and think. You know what? 
there's that space, exploit it. Because we may only just get one chance. Mate, it could be a one chance for fun. us, but not for them. So yeah. that's, where you, that's where you're going to need your, sh your shooting boots on, and that's where you're going to need and your If we get a chance, we've got to take it, let me tell yeah. you that. Yeah. 100%. Um, listen, before we wrap up, Kenny, what's your... Uh... Prediction for tomorrow. I've gone for a 2 2 draw. Unfortunately, I just don't see us getting the three points, mm. but I really hope that I'm wrong. And I think that we can, um, but I think they're going to kind of cancel each other out. Some people that I've spoken to have gone for 1 1. I think it'll be a Desmond 2 2. Mm. But what are you saying, bruv? I think that the, the fans who have um, predicted a 1 1 are thinking along the same lines as myself. I think it'll be a 1 1 as well. I think that, you know, in saying that, our best, our best chance of um, exploiting Man City is for those little spaces they leave when they're on the attack. Set piece is also a, a yep. great option for us as well. Obviously, the, the set piece man, my set piece um, guarantee is also, always Gab, Gabriel Magalesh because he just, for some reason, he just finds those little spaces in the box and he, you know, get a set piece. So that's where we're going to have to, you know, use our, um, of that to our advantage and also the space. But yeah, I do think that. If it's one-one after uh, with um, about fifteen minutes ago, I believe that both sides will wipe their wipe wipe their hands on their trousers and think, you know what, we haven't we haven't lost. We'll we'll we'll, we'll um, concentrate the games ahead um, in the midweek. Obviously, um, Man City have got um, Aston Villa. We got Luton. I do think yeah. that if it gets to that stage with twenty minutes to go, I think both sides will settle for a draw. More, more us than them, obviously. But Close. that that's how that's how I'm going. I can't see Arsenal winning it, but then again, I can't see them losing it. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? A lot of people are similar in terms of that. Just um, before I do let you go, Brighton, Liverpool. Do you see Brighton taking anything off of Liverpool? Absolutely Anthony? not. Absolutely not. Liverpool, Liverpool got the momentum. They're banging form. You know, despite the fact they lost against uh, Man United, that was a freak result that would. That you know that you know probably won't happen again. The reason why I'm going for Liverpool, simple reason, is that they're playing for Klopp. They're playing at Anfield, and most importantly, they the goals are they got goals in their team. Despite the fact that you know um, Luis Diaz doesn't have the the end product that a, a top player should have, the fact is you you've got you know Nunes is going to score. He's got a goal in him. You know Salah's back to his best, and also set pieces Van Dijk. And I think the bright this Brighton side, I think that they sold the family in silver. And I think this season is the first time that they've been affected from um, selling most of their spine. Also, they haven't coped significantly well with playing two games a week. And that's why I do think Liverpool will win it comfortably. You know, last season, I would have thought, yeah, Brighton might nick something, but I think you're living in hope if mm. you think Brighton are going to do us a favour. And anyway, when you're when you're a club like Arsenal. And I think Man City as well. You've got to sleep with one eye open. Assume that come 4.30, Liverpool are already beaten Brighton. So we are we do is important that both teams don't lose, especially us. Mm. No, it is. Listen, Brighton have actually done all right against Liverpool in the last few games they've played it, but I just don't see them turning up at Anfield personally. They can on their day, they're a good out good outfit, Brighton on their day, but I haven't seen enough of them this season, in my opinion. Um, listen, we're gonna get out of here. We're gonna go enjoy match of the day because it's been an absolute stunner for the goals today. Uh, but my thanks to yourself, Kenny, for coming on. Thank you so much, bruv. And uh wait, wait, where are you, are you going tomorrow or are you watching it? No, no, I, I will watch it in my living room. Living room on my own because all everyone's out. So I think if it's one of those games, you need to be in your own because you need to be able to swear at the TV on your own. You need to be able to kick the cat on your own. You need to be able to. Let's hope we're not doing that. It's like we're celebrating. Most you don't need to have is um, heart problems because you do need someone around you to resuscitate you if it goes in the wrong. But saying that, you you've done me. Um, a massive, massive favour because at the moment the whole family are watching reruns, and I mean reruns of the Inbetweeners. They're oh, in wow. at the moment. They're in series two at the moment, and all I can hear is just cackling and laughter. I do love, sure, I do love Inbetweeners. I'm, I must I'm, say, I'm it's sure, I'm sure, um, you know, Jay's telling two stories about all the women he's been with. <laughs> I love him, man. I love the Inbetweeners. Listen, people, do me a favour. Make sure you go follow Kenny Ken on Instagram and Twitter. 
make sure that you do like this video. What are we doing on likes at the moment? We're not even at 100, have we? Come on, we're one away from 100. Come on. Let's make sure we can get 100 likes. Let's make sure you're subscribing. We're getting very close to 20K. So please join the community to reach 20K. And please do click on the link to Surfshark VPN and make sure that you've sorted yourself out with a VPN uh, like myself and Lee Judges. If you didn't see the intro, then obviously go watch that on Catch Up or just click on the pinned comment and it will take you straight to it and you can get yourself Surfshark VPN like we all have as well. Um, listen, absolute pleasure to have you on, Kenny. Thank you so much, mate. Let's hope uh, that we it's, get it's, it's my tomorrow. pleasure. It's my pleasure. But right now, I, I, my advice to all you Arsenal fans, get some sleep. Get some sleep. We're going to need it. Absolutely. Listen. Take it easy, people. Smash a like on your way out. And as always, up the Arsenal. Take it easy.